Good morning. Welcome to Unit 7 Ecology Concept 3 Notes. We are going to be talking about a branch of ecology called population ecology, which is specifically looking at the relationships between organisms and their environment on a population level. So just a reminder from Concept 1, Intro to Ecology, a population is just a group of organisms of the same species living in the same place. So we would be looking at all of the penguins, you know, in this one area of the Arctic, and we would be looking at how they interact with each other and then how they interact with other organisms um, of different species and then how they interact with their environment. So we're just looking at the population level here. So when we're looking at a population, there's a couple of different ways that we describe populations. Now you can describe, uh, you can quantify a population of organisms by just the number there are, like there's 100 penguins or there's 5,000 chickens or whatever there may be. But a more helpful number to use um, to quantify a population is a population density. So this measures the number of individual organisms living in a defined space. And you could use any unit to measure this. So if there are, you know, a hundred chickens living in a hundred square feet of a coop, you could, you would divide a hundred chickens by a hundred square feet and say that there are one chicken per square foot in the coop. Um, if you're looking at how many deers are in a certain acreage of a farm, you know, if there are a hundred deer and there are 20 acres, you would do 100 divided by 20 and say there are five deer per acre. So as long as you keep track of your units as organisms per the spatial unit, you're good on how you do that math. It's a pretty simple math equation, if you will. But so when we're looking at population density, we can refer to populations as being a high population density or a low. So notice the defined space here is the same but the, there's a lot of organisms in this given space and then not as many organisms in this given space. So that's why we refer to population density. And there are a couple things that affect population density. So birth, which is also referred to as natality, and immigration, or organisms moving into a given space. Both of those will create a higher population density because they're gonna add organisms to our given space. Death, or mortality, and immigration or emigration, or I always say immigration, those cause low population density because they're going to be removing organisms from the defined space. Um, I think I for coming in and E for exiting to remember which are which. So those are two, or those are some of the different factors that can create a higher population density or a lower. So those are the larger overarching factors. Now, another way we can kind of um, look and describe populations is not just by their density, but we can also describe populations by their survivorship. And a survivorship curve is a graphic representation of mortality patterns. So if you remember from the last slide, mortality means um, death. So it's going to look at the number of individuals in a population that can be expected to survive, aka not die, to any specific age. Okay, let me explain more what that means. We kind of have three types of survivorship patterns that populations tend or species tend to follow. So one is a type one survivorship and that's based on this graph. So look at, we're looking at age. So as we're going to the right, we're getting older. And then as we're going up, we're um, like how likely you are to survive. So type or one organisms, they live early in life. They live long lives and then they die late at life. These are called late loss species. And in order for this to happen, they often have a heavy investment of parental care. You know, so they're, these species, you're going to have less offspring because you're going to put a lot of care into keeping them alive for a long time. And an example of this is humans. You know, humans tend to have less children so that they can put a lot in their children and get them to an age where they can survive and be independent on their own. That would be an example of a type one survivorship. Type 2 you see is constant loss. So mortality, and if you're going to die or survive, is unaffected by your age. Um, so some birds, some rodents, you're just kind of having a medium amount of kids your whole life. You're doing a medium amount investment into their survival. Um, and thus, like, the same amount are kind of going to die at birth versus die at middle age versus die at late age. It's just kind of more 
random. Type three are early loss survivorship. So these are species that produce a ton of offspring right away all at once, knowing that a ton of them are going to die and just hoping that some will go on to live. And so these are species that don't really care like a lot for their organisms. Once they're born, it's just kind of like, good luck. Hope you, some of you survive. And this is how fish and mosquitoes and some populations like that live. So this is a way that we can kind of represent from a visual standpoint, that idea of mortality. Um, another way we can kind of describe populations with, is with how are they are dispersed within their defined space. So dispersion is just looking at the spatial distribution of organisms in a population. So remember when we were looking at that high population density or low population density, kind of looking at how they're spaced out within their given space. And there's kind of three patterns we see. One is just random. So if each of these dots represents, you know, a different organism, they're just kind of randomly scattered in this defined space. There's no real pattern. Uniform or even is where they really are spaced out pretty evenly um, among the resources in their defined space. And then clumped is where they group up in like little groups of organisms throughout the different space. So these are different ways we can describe how organisms are dispersed in a population. Another way we describe populations is by how they grow. And they tend to follow two patterns, either exponential growth or logistic. Exponential looks like this. Um, it reminds me of that quote from Mean Girls, the limit does not exist. There's no limit. Population is growing without limit. And this is how the human population is right now. We are just creating more resources as we need them so that we can keep growing and growing and growing. Now, logistic growth is what we see in nature. And I remember this because the logistic has an S in it and it kind of looks like an S. So you see a population growing quickly. You see that exponential growth at first, but then it levels off. This is how most natural populations are. And this is a natural thing that happens because of limited resources creating competition. So organisms compete for those resources and some die off. And that leveling off point is called the carrying capacity. It's a theoretical maximum population that a given environment could support based on the resources it has. And it's theoretical because this level can change. As resources increase, this carrying capacity can be raised. As resources decrease, it could be lowered. And so that's what we mean by carrying capacity. Now, what limits the growth of a population? What makes there be a carrying capacity at all? And why don't we have one per se? These are limiting factors. So these are any aspect of the environment that can limit the size a population can reach. And we categorize limiting factors as biotic, which means living, or abiotic, which means non-living. So examples. A living biotic factor could be competition. You're competing with other living things. It could be predation, being hunted down by another organism. It could be like a bacterial disease that comes and sweeps through, that sort of thing. Whereas abiotic would be like a climate thing, like a natural disaster or flooding or something happens that can limit a population's growth. We can also classify limiting factors as density dependent or density independent. So this is where going back to understanding population density from the very beginning of our notes is important. So a density dependent limiting factor depends on the density. So it's going to have a bigger impact on a population that's more dense and a lesser impact on a population that is less dense. These, so these are factors that are triggered by an increase in population size and thus crowding. So for example, competition, predation, parasitism, disease, all these biotic things are density dependent. So think about this way in terms of disease. Think about, you know, right now, as I'm recording this, we're living through the COVID pandemic. And one of the main things to help prevent COVID is not being in densely crowded areas because the more dense a population is, the higher the density, the more likely that that disease can spread and affect more people. Whereas if we socially distance and we're not near each other and we're spread out, the disease has to travel from person to person. And so it can't do that. It would have a lesser impact in a smaller space. So COVID has had a much bigger impact in New York City, where it is extremely high population density, as opposed to Pickin, South Carolina, which is a really small town in the middle of upstate South Carolina. So that's where I did my student teaching. So that's why I brought it up. So that's what we mean by density dependent and it depending on the density. Whereas density independent is the opposite. 
its impact is independent of the density. It's going to regulate population growth regardless of whether it's New York City or Pickens, South Carolina. It doesn't matter. All species in an ecosystem are affected equally by these density-independent limiting factors. It's going to have an equal impact in New York City as it would in Pickens. So, for example, weather changes, pollution, natural disasters, etc. So, whether a, you know an earthquake hits New York City or it hits Pickens, it doesn't matter. It's not, it's not, the earthquake doesn't get bigger in size when it sees more living things as opposed to when it sees less. It's just going to affect it. And so that's what we mean by a density independent limiting factor. And that's your overview of population ecology.